Today we're going to talk about the 1973 war, the October War of 1973. This is another war of the Arab-Israeli conflict that really shows the polarization of views on the conflict itself. Uh, I talked about the 1948 war, is called the War for Israeli Independence, or Al-Nakba. We talked about the 1967 war, it's called maybe the June 67 war, or the Six Day War, depending on which side of the, the uh, story you find allegiance to. Uh, the October War of 1973 is another one. Uh, it's more commonly referred in the West uh, and in Israel as the Yom Kippur War. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Yom Kippur is one of the high holy days in the Jewish faith, and it's uh, the day that the war began. But impartial observers of this conflict will refer to it as the October War of 1973. So the June War of 67, now the October War of 73. In the lead up to that war, we've got a new leader of Egypt. And this is Anwar Sadat. We mentioned him last week. Um, he's going to take power in Egypt upon the death of Nasser. And Anwar Sadat is leading now an Egyptian nation that is in economic turmoil. Remember, the war in 67 not only cost Egypt the Sinai Peninsula, having given that up to uh, Israeli occupation, but it also closed down the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal is going to be closed down from, from 67 at the start of the war all the way until 1975. And this is a major economic blow to, uh, to Egypt. So Sadat comes into power... And he starts to, to establish control of Egypt. He's got some of the same political goals that Nasser had had, like, like regaining the Sinai Peninsula and reestablishing Egyptian prestige in the Middle East. But he's got some new economic policies from Nasser. And one aspect of that is to push a little bit closer with the United States. Now, let's go back to when we talked about the non-aligned movement in the Cold War. Do you guys recall that Egypt was one of those countries I threw out there being an important player in the non-aligned movement? And one aspect of being a non-aligned nation was that you could seek aid from both the Americans and the Soviets. So while Egypt was, after the Six-Day War, having their military rebuilt by the Soviets, Sadat is absolutely free to extend a hand uh, or, or reach for some handouts from the Americans. And so Sadat is going to push himself in, to try to have more uh, open diplomacy with the United States. The hope for Sadat, and he's a smart guy obviously, he knows that the United States is friendly with Israel. Remember, we are rebuilding the Israeli military. That the United States is friendly with Israel and so maybe if Egypt can get friendly with the United States, the United States might be able to convince their friends, Israel, to start giving that territory back to Egypt. You guys see how the circle can work here? All right? Egypt can't directly talk to Israel, but they can talk to Israel's friend. And maybe the Americans can put pressure on the Israelis. Unfortunately for Sadat, he realizes very soon that there will be no negotiations with Israel. He's even opening open to signing some kind of long-term peace agreement with Israel. But Israel is not willing to listen. From the Israeli perspective, they reject Sadat's proposals. They feel that they're in a position of strength. They have resoundly defeated their Arab neighbors in 1967. Their military is far better equipped than any of their Arab neighbors. The occupied territories provide them with tremendous buffer zones, especially the Sinai Peninsula between Egypt and Israel. Tremendous buffer zones between Egypt and the Israeli state. So if Egypt were ever to threaten Israel again, it would have to go through the Sinai rather than in Israel proper. So Israel feels that it's in no position to need to bargain, to need to negotiate, because they, are at, they have such an upper hand, especially militarily. So Sadat starts to move closer to the United States. He makes attempts to move closer to the United States. One condition the Americans put on Sadat is that he needs to, to begin to distance himself from the Soviet Union. 
Soviet Union, after the Six-Day War, rebuilt the Egyptian military and had established a naval base in Egypt on the Mediterranean Sea. So Sadat responds affirmatively to that. In July of 1972, he will order all Russian military out of Egypt. All Russian military advisors out of Egypt. 72. It's at the same time that Sadat begins to move more closely with other Arab nations, especially Syria. And Anwar Sadat and Egypt and Syria begin to have secret negotiations to launch a war against Israel. Now I know this kind of sound, sounds crazy. Like we just talked about Sadat wanting peace with Israel. And now he starts working out a deal for, with Syria to have war with Israel. This is the, the perfect definition of what we are going to call a limited war in this class. Okay, and We'll talk more about this uh, in detail next week. But a limited war does not look for the absolute destruction or defeat of your enemy. All right? A limited war does not require you to completely overrun your enemy's territory. Sadat wants to start a war with Israel that will be limited in nature in order to get the Americans to step up to the Israelis and say, hey Israel, this craziness in the Middle East has got to stop. And so you need to talk with Egypt and work out some long-term agreement. Because before 1973, Israel's got no reason to talk to Egypt, no reason to negotiate with Egypt. Remember, the Arab nations have said since 1967, no peace with Israel, no recognition with Israel, no negotiation with Israel. So why should Israel have to listen to people that are still trumpeting lines like that? A limited war with Israel could force the issue, could have America force Israel to talk with Egypt and then come to some long-term peace. And this is what Nasser, or pardon me, Sadat starts to plan. Now Syria, why are they in the mix? They, they've got the same aims as Sadat. They want to regain their lost territory of the Golan Heights. And for both of them, the hope is if you start this little war, the Americans or the Soviets, or the Americans and the Soviets, will influence the end of the war and the bringing of long-term peace. As we've already mentioned, the Israeli position it seems absolutely secure. Egypt seems weak. The other Arab nations seem weak compared to Israel. And then you've got a lot of international sympathy going towards Israel in the summer of 1972. What else happens in the summer of 1972? We've already talked about. That's the Munich Olympic Games. So that was so publicized around the world. It, it, it lent a lot of sympathy for, for the state of Israel. So they're feeling pretty confident in their position in 1972 and 73. And their government absolutely misses the warning signs that an attack was imminent. The war will come in October of 1973. When Egypt and Syria simultaneously invade uh, the Israeli-occupied Sinai and the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. So attacking from the south, attacking from the north. What do we call that when a country is being attacked? That's a two-front war. It's on a much smaller scale than maybe the First World War, but it's a two-front war that they're fighting, right? This starts on the, uh, the Jewish holiday. Oh, uh, spilled the water, and but I saved from saving a bad word on my recording. Nuts. That's a lot of water. Oh, boy. That's Burex papers. I know. Is Mutu in the building today? Who do I blame? Oh, man, that's not cool. Um, so, 
Israel is in an absolutely secure position. The war comes on October 6, 1973. It's on the Jewish High Holy Day of Yom Kippur. This is the Jewish Day of Atonement for sins and whatnot to ask for forgiveness. Um, and so no one was expecting the war to come. All right? Think of it kind of like, uh, maybe you want to compare this, Eddie, to uh, the Tet Offensive. Uh, during, uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, so it was a, it was a holiday, uh, reservists were with their families, uh, the country was not on, on high alert. The opening week of the war is absolutely successful for the Arab nations. Uh, Israel and, or pardon me, Egypt and Syria each drive Israel back from their positions in the Golan Heights and uh, up in the north in the Sinai Peninsula. So Egypt push, uh, Golan, Golan Heights and, and in the north, in the Sinai Peninsula, in the south. I'm off the rails right now. Um, you can see the Egyptian forces push across the Suez Canal. Uh, here is a, a photo of a pontoon bridge created across the Suez Canal so the Egyptians can make it in. Um, so the initial week goes quite well. Israel will appeal to Washington, D.C. for military aid, which the United States does give. Now, this kind of sounds weird, because we don't really want a war in the Middle East, so why are we giving military aid to the Israelis? Well, we've already had agreements with them, sure. We don't want Israel to lose, okay? We don't want war, but we also don't want Israel to be defeated, because an Israeli defeat might mean future war, right? And by the same token, Egypt and Syria are still going to be receiving some arms from the Soviet Union, Yeah, kind of like a proxy war. But mind you, this is happening all during what Cold War time period? This is all during detente. Also, 1973, this is the year that the United States is getting out of Vietnam, right? We bring our troops home in the spring of 1973. The United States really does not want another war to deal with, certainly uh, with the Soviet Union. An Israeli counterattack in the second week of the war pushes the Egyptians and the Syrians back especially Syria, who was pushed out of the Golan Heights um, all the way to uh, Damascus. Egyptian forces will be driven back in the Sinai as well. While this war is going down, OPEC nations get involved. OPEC is an acronym for the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. They are some of the biggest oil producing nations in the world, most of them around the Persian Gulf, but there's also like Nigeria, for example, Libya and Africa, uh, Venezuela. The OPEC nations, they're, an, uh, they're a cartel. Uh, you guys probably hear this word only in association with like the drug trade in, in Latin America. Um, a cartel is an organization of producers that attempt to control a market, all right? So all of the OPEC nations, they have joined together into this organization to try to exercise control over the oil markets. Now, the, the way this works is, is OPEC decides, and you don't need to write this down, just hear it. OPEC will decide as a collective group how much oil they should produce. Should we increase production? Should we decrease production? Should we maintain the status quo? Um, Increasing production for OPEC would mean what for oil prices if demand remains the same? It would mean prices would drop. And if demand stays the same and they decrease production, that means prices would rise. All right? Um, you guys have probably noticed in the last year or two, oil prices have dramatically fallen around, around the world. This is coming from a, a decrease in demand expectations, but OPEC has like stood fast with their, their continuing to produce at, the, at traditional levels. Um, part of the reason, it, it's a political game, OPEC feels that by keeping oil prices low, their countries are better able to, to last this, this oil crisis compared to countries like Russia or the United States or Canada. Um, so it, it's, it's more of an attempt to hurt other nations' oil businesses, which it is, um, rather than OPEC. Now, most of the OPEC nations, these aren't democracies, okay? These aren't places that do a lot of, like, the spreading of the wealth to, to the populations. Um, these are government-controlled industries for the most part. Anyhow, during this war, OPEC will start an oil boycott, selling oil, a boycott of selling oil to any nation that is friendly with Israel. 
This is kind of exerting economic warfare into this, this Arab-Israeli conflict. So OPEC will stop oil shipments to any nation that is supporting Israel. Now, this is a far bigger effect immediately on Western Europe than it does the United States. Like, for example, do you guys know today where the United States gets most of its oil from? <laughs> yeah, North Dakota. We, we get most of our oil from us. We, we domestically produce most of the oil that, that we, or a majority of the oil that we use, a plurality, I guess we should say. Uh, then where do we get most of our oil from? Canada. Then Canada, then Mexico, then Venezuela, okay, down in, down in Latin America. Um, so we get a lot of our oil, like, from ourselves and from the Western Hemisphere. So, so anybody that says the United States can't be reliant on Middle Eastern oil, we're not. We, we don't get our oil. That, that would be stupid for us to be getting all of our oil from the Middle East when we've got plenty of oil, like here, right? But Europe is absolutely reliant on Middle Eastern oil. But then there's, an, uh, there's a global oil market, okay? And so when, when there's an oil crisis in Europe, when oil prices are dramatically on the rise in Europe, that has a trickle-down effect on America. Because oil producers in the United States, if they can sell their oil for more in Europe, what are they going to start doing? They'll start shipping it there which can lead to shortages in the United States. So when there's, a, when there's an oil shock in one part of the international oil... With this OPEC crisis, take a look at what will happen to global oil prices. These two lines, the numbers are hard to read. Those years along the bottom uh, there, they go from the 1860s all the way until roughly today. And you can see two lines. The blue one is what are called nominal prices. Nominal prices, those are the actual prices for a barrel of oil that year. So if you got into your time machine and you zipped yourself all the way back to 1868, a barrel of oil would cost you about 10 bucks. If you went back to 1921, a barrel of oil would cost you about six bucks maybe. All right? Those are the nominal prices. But nominal prices don't tell us all that much. Like when your grandma lets you know that in 1927, she went to the picture show and it cost her 75 cents and she got popcorn as well, or whatever it might have cost back then. Tell her, Nana, okay, cool it with your nominal prices because they don't tell me much. All right? Would you adjust that for inflation? Could you give me that in 2013 dollars? Or what we would say, could you give me that figure in real dollars? Like something that actually makes sense to me, not this like imaginary 1927 currency that I, I'm not familiar with because there's been so much inflation. So your grandma would then would have to bust out her calculator and calculate the change uh, in inflation over those years. So how much was, was 75 cents in 1927? How much is it actually worth today? And that's where we see on this... Should we just call that a maze line? Sure. Yeah, yeah, maze. maze line. On the maze line, these are the real prices. That's what it would actually cost in today's dollars. So, in 1866, if a barrel of oil was about $10 a gallon, well, in today's prices, that would be about $110 a gallon. All right? That would be like the most, or a barrel, I should say, a barrel, not a, not a gallon. Uh, <laughs> that would be the most expensive that, that oil really has, has ever been up until the modern day. But look at what oil, look at the cost of oil over most of the last, like, 150 years. It was like nothing. Because most of this is the time where, where Jed Clampett is going into his backyard shooting for food, and up from the ground comes bubbling crude. Like, oil is everywhere, right? <laughs> it's really easy to get. It's accessible. And we're sucking it out of, out of, out of the, the entire United States, right? We're finding it very easily. Today, things have changed a little bit, right? We use, the world uses far more oil than it's ever used, and we've kind of found all the easy-to-get-to stuff. So now we have to go a little bit deeper into the water, or a little bit deeper underground, or start using some new techniques to extract oil from places we didn't even know we could extract oil from uh, going, going back uh, decades. One dirty little secret. You guys want to hear this? It's controversial. I, I shouldn't even put this on a podcast. <laughs> The world will never run out of oil. Never, ever? Never, ever. <laughs> never, ever, ever. You've been told the world will run out of oil before, haven't you? And people have used the year, like, 2050. I think, by 2050, there will be no more oil. That's not true at all. There will always be oil in the earth. What's that? No, no, it's not producing nearly as fast as we're consuming it. 
Um, so, so, no, we, we can't wait for that grandma in 1927 to turn into oil. Oh, that's smart. <laughs> but you know what? She kept talking about how cheap things used to be, and it just got frustrating. <laughs> yeah, just got um, no, we can't wait for, like, younger dinosaurs to turn into oil. That, that takes too long, all right? But what we can do, and what we always do, what we are doing right now, is we're finding new sources. Oil that we're getting today, we would have never gotten 50 years ago. We didn't have the ability to go out that deep and dig that deep. Or if we did have the ability, it would have just cost way too much to do it. But as oil gets more hard to find, as the price of oil will start to go up or continues to go up, guess what it becomes worth it to do? Dig a little bit deeper for it, right? Like you don't bet when you're walking down the... Many of you guys don't even bend over and pick up a penny you see anymore. You're just like, there's a penny. <laughs> That's a lot of, not even worth it to bend over to pick it up anymore. <laughs> but what if you were able to find out that pennies, because they're of their sheer beauty and the, the art that's involved in that, 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 that drawing of Lincoln on there, that they were worth more than a penny, if they were worth not a penny but like a million dollars, would you bend over and pick it up? Yeah. Absolutely. Would you, would you start digging in your backyard for lost pennies? Yeah. Absolutely. You would do things that you would have never otherwise done now that that thing holds more value. And so we will always have oil. It just depends, is it going to ever be worth it for us to go get it? There's all kinds of oil under the deepest depths of the ocean. It's just too deep to go get, right? But if oil ever became so valuable where it was worth it to go get it, you would totally go get that stuff, right? So we'll never actually run out of oil. We'll run out of easy-to-get oil, and then we'll start getting harder to get oil. By that time, what might happen, what would likely happen, is other forms of energy are just cheaper to do then. And so we'll, we'll go there. But oil will never run out. Maybe. Who knows? So anyway... Look what happens to the prices of oil. We've, we've got like absolute stagnation in even the real value of, of oil based on $2,008 until we get to 1973. In 1973, the OPEC oil cartel, a cartel is not just a thing that gets involved in the drug business. A cartel is any organization that can control the market of a commodity. All right? The OPEC oil cartel they decide to stop selling oil to countries in support of Israel. And so global oil prices are going to skyrocket to, to levels that they have never been seen since the modern age began, right? So by 1981, people in real dollars are paying $100 a barrel for oil. So that's a lot of money. And this is going to... Now, now people don't just say, you know what, I'm on Team Israel because... We kind of felt bad about what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust, and we kind of felt bad about what happened with the 1972 Summer Olympics in Munich. So I'm on Team Israel. Now they're saying, yeah, I kind of feel bad about what happened to the Olympics, but whoo, gas got expensive. So maybe I need to rethink my position here and be a little bit more sympathetic to the Arab cause as well. Yes, ma'am? Are people really buying barrels? No, people don't buy barrels, but, but that's, that's what you measure the value of oil in. But, but when, they, when the price of a barrel of oil, like who buys barrels of oil? Uh, Exxon and gas co companies that refine that into gasoline. So whatever the price of a barrel of oil is, that translates to, to a uh, gallon of gasoline. <coughs> Walter White buys barrels, though, for his money. <laughs> So anyway, OPEC restricts this oil. And now the world will go through a global oil shortage. And this is tough. Because in the 1970s, we were driving some boats. All right? <laughs> cars in the 90s, even two-door cars, like sports cars in the 1970s, were massive. What's that? Yeah, yeah these, these are huge, steel, American-made behemoth cars that are getting like six and seven miles per gallon. <laughs> Very good, yeah. And to connect this story to today, this is part of the reason why the, the, why the big three in Detroit have had such an issue over the last 25 years. Japan, companies like Honda and Toyota, they were around in the 70s, and they were making little cars for Japanese people. And they started to bring... And why, why are they making little cars in Japan? Because Japan is a densely populated place. 
You can't, there's not a lot of room in Tokyo. No one's got three-car garages in Tokyo. <laughs> or, or what we call in America, a three-car garage is a one-car garage, and then, then two, two car spots for all your stuff. No one has that kind of space in Japan, so they make smaller cars. They make smaller cars. So Japan shipped those Toyotas and Hondas to the United States at a time when American car companies were making massive cars. And um, some American buyers said, gosh, I would love a more fuel-efficient car rather than these choices that, that the American companies are giving us. So they started to buy Hondas and Toyotas, especially on the coast. We don't buy it much here, but if you guys go to, to New York, well, you, you went to New York. Many yeah. of you. If you go to New York, you go to the East Coast, you go to the West Coast, no one buys American cars. It's, it's crazy. Um, BMWs, Mercedes, Hondas, Toyotas, Lexi, Lexuses, Lexuses, Lexuses. 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 <laughs> anyway, so the American car companies had a hard time competing with these more fuel efficient uh, Asian models. So a global oil shortage is going to start exerting pressure on this war like never had been done before. Now there's a vested interest to end this conflict. Above and beyond, just like not wanting a war in the Middle East. And this was a uh, the uh, OPEC's like this goal was, all along. This is OPEC's goal all along, absolutely. By the third week of the war, after it started well for the Arabs, then went back for the the Israelis. By the third week of the war, the superpowers are involved. American Secretary of State now, American Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, is going to get on a plane and go to the Soviet Union and talk with Leonid Brezhnev. This is really bringing the Cold War story with the Arab-Israeli story, right? To, to stop a war between Israel and Egypt, you've got to have an American Secretary of State go to the Soviet Union and talk with Leonid Brezhnev. And they hammer out, they hammer out an agreement to end the war. And Kissinger will present it to the Israelis, and Brezhnev will present it over to the Egyptians. Initially, both the Israelis and the Arabs are reluctant to accept these terms, but with a little further pressure from the, the Americans and the Soviets, they do, and the war comes to an end. And this is by October 24th, 1973. The consequences of this war, for Egypt first, for Anwar Sadat, it wasn't a victory. Okay, he did not regain the Sinai Peninsula. But it wasn't a loss. And that's big. So he didn't, he didn't lose. He didn't win, but he didn't lose. And it's going to be the first time that an Arab state went to war with Israel and won. And, and, and didn't lose, I should say. And that's big. Plus they're on terms with each other. They're not like not knowing each other. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Also, throughout the course of this war, it's the first time that the Arab states actually stayed unified with each other, rather than some going off on their own direction. And this was helped out by the OPEC embargo, kept all those Arab states together. Another outcome of this war is going to be for the Palestinians. Because now the Europeans, who might have previously been sympathetic towards the Jews and towards Israel... Now, after they had their pockets squeezed by the OPEC uh, shortage, now they're going to say, you know what? This Arab-Israeli conflict can't truly be solved until the Palestinian issue is dealt with. Like, more sympathy is going to go out towards the Arab plight and for the Palestinian cause, especially from Europeans. That seems so superficial. Well, we are superficial people. <laughs> Sadat, Anwar Sadat in Egypt, is going to be viewed like a new Nasser. And Egypt's political status in the, in the area, which was certainly hurt by the 1967 war, is going to be sky high again. So Sadat walks out of this looking really good. For the Israeli side, technically, like, they won, I guess you can say. For Israel, they, they kind of won. Because they were attacked, they got pushed back, and then in the end, they pushed the Egyptians back. So at the end of the war, they kind of ended up in the same spot. 
But this war was crippling for Israel, like no other war had been. The Prime Minister of Israel, a woman named Golda Meir, and her Defense Minister, Moshe Dayan, the eye patch guy from back in 1967, they're both going to resign in shame. Because they didn't see this coming. They thought their country would be ready for something like this, and they weren't. For the first time in an Arab-Israeli war, for the first time in an Arab-Israeli war, prisoners were taken. Israeli prisoners were taken, I should say. 3,000 Israeli troops were dead. Over 8,000 injured in the course of this war. 3,000 troops? 3,000 soldiers, yes. Same thing. What's the difference? So this is a like the, really the first, since 1948, the first really costly war that Israel has fought. And imagine, their people were told and they believed since 1967 that they were invincible and that they would never be attacked. And now they were attacked and they fight the most costly war that they'd ever fought. Now there's a lot of questioning about the Israeli government's policies. The Israeli government seems perfectly fine living in a state of war with its neighbors because they believed its neighbors would never attack. And if its neighbors ever did attack, that the Israeli army would be able to mop them up just like they did in 67. But that didn't happen here. So the Israeli nation, the people in Israel, not all of them, but, but a larger group than ever before, started to publicly question its government's position with its neighbors. And for the first time, a peace movement, a, a large peace movement, is going to grow amongst Israeli population. Like people in Israel now demanding peace with its neighbors rather than war with its neighbors. <laughs> I think this war is fraught with irony, right? Anwar Sadat wants peace with Israel. So he has to go to war to, in order to achieve the negotiations that can bring peace. The Israeli state, the state of Israel and the people of Israel think that living in, with a constant state of war is how they will stay safe. By, that, that, by building up a stronger and stronger military will keep them forever safe, but that proved not to be the case. And it was a war, not that Israel started, but a war that was brought to Israel. Egypt started this war, Syria started this war in 73 that would make the Israeli people not hungry for more war, but make the Israeli people actually hungry for peace. So, very counterintuitive story here. So in the end, Israelis are going to be more supportive of peace movements and, and actually opening up some lines of negotiation with outsiders. <coughs> now the role of the United States here, Henry Kissinger is going to be very important. Henry Kissinger is going to be very important. As our Secretary of State, he is going to be instrumental in talking to both sides. Because Egypt and Israel are not going to have direct negotiations yet. They're not ready for that yet. But they will negotiate through Henry Kissinger in what's going to be known as shuttle diplomacy. Please know that phrase, shuttle Shuttle diplomacy. Henry Kissinger will go talk to the Egyptians and find out what they're willing to do. And then he will get on a plane and fly to Jerusalem and talk with the Israelis and find out what they're willing to accept. And then he'll fly back and talk to the Egyptians and go back and talk to the Israelis. And at the end, he gets the Israelis to agree to start backing off the Suez Canal. And we can look at this map here. He gets the Israelis to agree to back off of the canal zone. He's our Secretary of State, yes, at that time. So a number of trips back and forth between Egypt and, and, and Israel gets the Israelis to agree to start backing their forces from some of the Sinai Peninsula. Not all of it at all, but some of it, as a sign of goodwill. But guess what this is going to do? It's, it's a negotiation. It's exactly what Sadat wanted. Now there's talking going on. But it's showing that the Israelis are willing to do what? Compromise and give up some land in order to achieve peace. 
who's going to be very excited to hear that the Israelis are going to be willing to give up some land in order to achieve peace? The Palestinians. Very good. So this is going to suggest to the Palestinians that maybe partial withdrawal today might lead to more withdrawals of Israel in the future. Like that this is maybe just the first step. This is going to lead, in the aftermath of 1973, to the growth of the PLO. Now, the PLO had already existed. You guys remember the PLO, the Palestine, Palestine Liberation Organization. The PLO. And this is a lot of what Dr. Matthews talked about yesterday. In the absence of interstate wars... Now that Egypt and Israel seem like they're going to be done fighting wars, the PLO as a non-state actor will, will grow in prominence. The PLO is going to become recognized as the sole representative of the Palestinian people. So it's not going to be Egypt anymore advocating for Palestinians or Jordan anymore advocating for Palestinians. It's going to be the PLO as recognized now by Arab states as the sole representative of the Palestinian cause. Yeah. So Yasser Arafat used to be the leader of the PLO? Yep, yeah, he was the leader of the PLO. And so he's no longer involved? He's today? At this point. No, at this point he is the leader at this point. Yeah, he's the leader through the 70s and 80s and 90s and into the 2000s. But if they were kicked out of Jordan, where are they now? They went to Lebanon. They were in southern Lebanon. So, yeah, this is on the heels of, you know, in recent history, Jordan fighting Black September with, uh, or, or going through Black September with the PLO, where the Jordanian army targeted the PLO and booted them out of Jordan. Well, now in the aftermath of the, uh, the 1973 war, this October war of 73, the PLO will be recognized by Arab states as the sole and legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. And the right, they will be given the right to establish a Palestinian state on Palestinian territories. In fact, the nation of Jordan will give up any claims that it has to the West Bank. Yasser Arafat will be invited to go to the United Nations, and here's him speaking in New York. Yasser Arafat, as a leader of the PLO, is invited to the United Nations, and he's going to speak for the Palestinian cause and the Palestinian right of return to their homeland at the United Nations. And even the PLO in the 1970s will be given what's called observer status at the United Nations. They'll be recognized not as a state, but they will have a seat in the United Nations, not voting, but they'll be able to be there. They'll enjoy observer status at the United Nations. It's starting to legitimize the PLO. Before, it wasn't seen as legit by a lot of people, especially when there was a lot of terrorist activities and and bombings and hijackings that were connected to the PLO. Now, by the mid-1970s, it's looking like the PLO. It's certainly recognized by the Arab world and now the United Nations as a representative of the Palestinian people. But how does Israel feel about that? Israel is not happy at all. Israel is furious at this. Israel thinks the PLO is a terrorist organization, thinks that Yasser Arafat is a, is a leader of a terrorist organization. So Israel's not happy. But what happened with 73? 73 changed the way the world looked at the Arab-Israeli conflict. Before 1973, outside of the Arab world, Israel got a lot of sympathy because of the memories of the Holocaust, because of 1972 at Munich in Germany, the Olympics. After 73, more sympathy is going towards the Arab cause and the Arab plight. Now, how much of this is connected to higher oil prices? That's for you to decide. Um, But certainly, more sympathy will go out towards the Arab plight in the aftermath. But let's not underestimate, where does Western Europe get all of their oil from? It's the Persian Gulf region. They need friendly relationships with Arab states. Questions, comments, concerns? Questions? 